Latin American, and uh, Caribbean affairs. Before taking his current position, he served in a number of key military positions, including the United States Central Command as commander of the 76th Operational Response Command Infantry and as deputy commander for mobilization and reserve affairs for the Southern Command. He has been deployed five times to Iraq, three times to Afghanistan, and spent 17 years in South America, which included 12 years in Brazil. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering from the U.S. Military Academy, earned his master's degree in public administration from Webster's University, a Bachelor's of Arts degree in history and Portuguese at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, and a doctorate in international relations from Columbia University. He has written four really fine historic military books based upon Latin America and Army experiences, including you know, war, Wars Then and Now, In War's Shadow, Waging Peace in Central America, The Army and Low Intensity Conflict, and In War's Shadow at the Edge of the Cold War. He is a recipient of a long list of awards, and I won't name them all because we want him to have full time, but they include the Defense Superior Service Medal and the Bronze Star with an oak leaf cluster. General, we are thrilled that you joined us this morning. Thank you, Carla, and uh, good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I want to thank the um, CAF Development Bank, uh, the Inter-American Dialogue, and the Organization of American States for hosting this event and bringing together so many leaders and experts to discuss the opportunities and challenges facing the Western Hemisphere. Now, if you heard my uh, bio description there, you're wondering, how could I do all of that? Well, I happen to be an Army reservist. Uh, so I was living in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and doing my reserve duty in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan every year. Uh, so I used to talk particularly to students, and I was mentioning this to the ambassador before. I would say, you know, I'm kind of the face of globalization. I live in Brazil. I was working at that time, most of that time, for a, a, a British company, and yet I was deploying from Brazil to Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's kind of a scary portfolio, but that's the world we live in today. I'm delighted to be here today to represent the White House and to share some remarks with you. And as you can imagine, I get to read prepared remarks, okay, um, but I will take questions at the end of it, okay. Once I get through the suffering, we'll do the questions, okay. First off, uh, the President's actions show that this administration cares deeply about the Western Hemisphere. The region and our partnerships are a key priority for this administration. From the five presidential visits that have already occurred at the White House and the more than a dozen presidential phone calls to heads of state in Latin America, to the Vice President's trip to Central and South America just last month and all the conferences and exchanges in between, it's clear that our administration understands that the region's security and prosperity directly affects our own here at home. It's worth taking a moment to explore how we arrived at this point in time. We are fortunate that we have a positive story to tell in the hemisphere. The values of freedom, democracy, prosperity, and security have truly taken hold in the hemisphere over the last 35 years. 35 years ago, much of this hemisphere was marred by dictatorships and protracted insurgencies that promoted failed ideologies, killed hundreds of thousands, and stifled the Western Hemisphere's true potential. With few exceptions, we have seen peace and democracy flourish across the region in those intervening uh, three decades. And market economies are boosting the living standards for tens of millions. The numbers speak for themselves. According to the IMF, 
the hemisphere's purchasing power increased sevenfold since 1980. In Central America, as an example, where insurgencies once raged and have now ended, and stable political systems have been established that allow for market-oriented economies to take root, purchasing power increased tenfold. Furthermore, GDP growth has been consistent around or above 4% each year in Central America despite all the problems that are still there, 4% since 2010, according to the IMF. Success like this demonstrates how opportunities emerge from investing in peace, empowering the people, and making reforms that encourage growth and competition. This progress stands in stark contrast to those few countries in the world who cling to failed ideologies and are moving backwards or are stagnated. The United States public and private sectors have invested in the Western Hemisphere region and will continue to do so because this strategy works and provides positive results. The region's embrace of democracy and the power of free market principles has strengthened the bonds between our countries. As the Vice President said in Argentina last month, our hemisphere's interests are intertwined and our futures are forever linked. Indeed, as a former Minister of Defense from a Latin American country recently told a delegation of U.S. flag officers it was visiting, he put it this way, you Americans need to understand that we are moving beyond mere common interest to shared values. Now we realize that our fates will rise or fall together and that we must work together to ensure continued security and prosperity for our people. As a result, we are pursuing our priorities and securing our vital interests in the Western Hemisphere in close coordination with our partners. For example, the President recently ordered the creation of an aggressive strategy to dismantle the criminal cartels that have spread all across our nation. The President and this administration know, however, that to be successful in this endeavor, we must work closely with our partners in Mexico and throughout Central America to aggressively pursue the criminal organizations, their networks, and their illicit finances. Make no mistake that our progress for, against the MS-13 gang and other organizations here in the United States would not be possible without our partners in the region. We will continue to provide the tools, training, and support needed for the rule of law to continue to combat organized crime. Likewise, we must continue together to target the drug trade as part of that effort. The President is committing is committed to fighting the drug addiction problem here in the United States and has promised, in fact, to break the dangerous habit that we have and is putting substantial funds towards that end. But we must continue to work with our Central American and South American partners to target the narcotics trade, both at its source and in transit north towards our borders. And we also have to recognize that quite a few uh, Latin American countries also have a significant uh, consumption problem of their own now. After all, it's worth recognizing that the fighting over these transit routes and distribution nodes is what causes the deaths of so many people across particularly Central America and Mexico in, as the tr drugs transit to the north. Of course, we are alarmed by the recent record numbers of coca cultivation in Colombia and opium poppy cultivation in Mexico, both of which have been on the rise now for several years and we urge our Colombian and Mexican counterparts to take the lead in eradicating the narcotics problem at its source, and we are committed to doing all we can to support them. Both of these countries have been valuable partners for training of security forces across the region, and we hope that with Col Colombia's historic peace agreement with the FARC now being implemented, that we may have greater resources to devote towards denying safe haven for narcotics production across Mexico and the source countries in South America. While we are concerned with the destructive effect of drugs on our people, another corrosive agent also threatens to undo the progress we have achieved, and that is corruption, which, if unchecked, could erode the foundations that uphold our democratic systems and the open markets that have fueled so much growth across the Western Hemisphere. The scale of this problem is staggering, 
as we saw from the largest scandal in the region, Operação Lava Jato, which is not just a Brazilian problem. The tentacles reach into several countries and across continents. We have made much progress, but we still face challenges in ridding our hemisphere of corruption, and our administration welcomes the robust discussion hosted by this conference on this important topic. That we are willing to discuss corruption openly underscores our collective interest in finding solutions to address and solve the problem. And we look forward to any recommendations that may come from the discussions here. And we commend Peru for having all of us focus on democratic governance as a means to fight corruption during the Summit of the Americas that Peru will host next spring. Open discussions like these are important not only for solving shared problems, but also for ensuring that our trade partnerships are as effective and productive as they can be. As the Vice President observed in Chile last month, the United States is the largest trading partner for two-thirds of this hemisphere, and our trade across the hemisphere last year, U.S. trade, was more than double our trade with China. In terms of exports, we export almost five times as much to Mexico, Canada, and the rest of the hemisphere as we do to China. Latin America, meanwhile, has doubled its direct investment in the United States since 2008 at a pace that is still gathering steam. And we are thrilled that Argentina will be hosting the G20 next year as this reinforces South America's significance in the world and as a trading partner for the United States. While we have shared the success of growing trade, we should not take this for granted. We can always do better. And that is precisely what our president intends to do as we modernize NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. We are in agreement that NAFTA needs updating. The world has changed significantly since this agreement came into effect 23 years ago, and so have our economies. We must account for important aspects of international trade that simply did not exist in 1994, but are indispensable in our highly digitized and interconnected world today. NAFTA needs to modernize to remain relevant, boost our competitiveness, and address trade imbalances. As Ambassador Lighthizer, our trade representative, said in his opening remarks um, at NAFTA last month, we must also develop provisions for NAFTA that can be used far into the future and that are flexible to account for future innovations. Only then can NAFTA bring us freer, fairer, and reciprocal trade, as well as deeper ties with our partners over the longer term. Finally, amid an overall good news story that we are promoting within our hemisphere, I would like to share some thoughts on the most glaring crisis that faces us in the Western Hemisphere today, and that is Venezuela's descent into dictatorship and its self-inflicted downward spiral economically. The Venezuelan regime's behavior is repugnant and contrary to the forward progress we have seen across the rest of the region. Under the Maduro regime, Venezuela's economy has contracted by 26% since 2014, and inflation is well known to be somewhere near 720% or higher, figures that are worse than our Great Depression. Although we have discussed the Western Hemisphere growing prosperity and increased standards of living, we see the polar opposite in Venezuela. It should be unthinkable that basic foodstuffs and medicine would run scarce in this hemisphere anywhere in 2017. In a similar way, we should, have, we should never have such a humanitarian crisis unfolding as we do now in Venezuela, as Venezuelans seek asylum across the region. But that is the sad reality of this man-caused disaster. By any reasonable metric, the regime has failed the Venezuelan people and is turning Venezuela into a failed state. What was once one of South America's uh, most prosperous nations is now one of its poorest and one of the world's most corrupt. The President has made his sense of urgency very clear on resolving this crisis, and we have taken several steps of our own to punish the regime and the members of the regime while still trying to support the Venezuelan people. And we are glad to see that the region is unified in calling on the Maduro regime to restore democracy and basic freedoms. Brazil, for example, has, was instrumental in expelling Venezuela from Mercosur, and we applaud the 12 countries that came together to sign the Lima Declaration. These are unmistakable signs that the Western Hemisphere does not tolerate the path that Maduro has chosen. 
If we wish to successfully avoid a second dictatorship taking hold in our hemisphere, we must see more action from all of us. Everyone gathered here should consider what we can do to affect positive change in Venezuela while there's still time. But as we discussed earlier, the continued security and prosperity of our region is a responsibility that we all share. And now is certainly no time for hand-wringing. Although we face challenges, the Western Hemisphere has significant cause for optimism. We are more connected by ideas, values, and economics than ever before. Our bonds are strong, and opportunities exist to make the 21st century a century of prolonged prosperity and lasting security across North, Central, and South America. The Western Hemisphere has a committed partner in this president and his administration to make that happen. Thank you. And now I'll take some questions. Okay. Anybody? Other questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Who, one. who wants to be the first victim? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Evan Ellis, U.S. Army War College. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your service, General. I yeah. uh, wanted to uh, ask you, uh, with respect to uh, the range of tools that the United States right. has, both on the State Department side as, as well as uh, military engagement and the security cooperation programs within the region, and clearly mm -hmm. the state partner programs and the National Guard, as you look at the range of tools that we have, as mm -hmm. we try to continue to be a partner of choice to the region, maintain governance, um, good governance, uh, maintain prosperity, particularly in light of all other alternatives offered by, by China, Russia, et cetera. What do you see as, as some of the tools which perhaps have been underutilized or which could be utilized more or differently in this environment of scarce resources to more effectively be that partner of choice? Okay, great question. I think, um, at least in the military, we always talk about uh, four elements of power, right, that we have, uh, diplomatic information, uh, military, and economic. And so your question uh, would be, you know, which ones could we use more or better? Uh, for really the last 35 years, we have actually focused very heavily on the diplomatic um, and the economic uh, side of the house. Uh, not so much on the military, except in the partnership building uh, arena, building partner capacity. Uh, we actually, it's probably astounding that we have such a deep relationship with most countries in the region now on the military side of the house in a cooperative way. Um, for those of you familiar with Southern Command, uh, twice a year at least they'll have large exercises uh, that are mandated by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. One of those brings together anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 of the uh, Hemisphere's uh, countries to participate, and we parcel out uh, the major subordinate commands to uh, partner nations. So your combined forces land component command will be often a Brazilian, the Maritime Command will rotate among the other nations of the hemisphere. Um, our problem, when we look at other competitors, Russia and China, um, you have to ask what it is they have to offer. Uh, the Russians have military equipment predominantly to offer, uh, but of course the record of that is different. When we sell military systems, we often uh, require the recipient country to buy the logistics package that goes with it. Because if you sell a sophisticated military system without the logistics and maintenance package, you often end up with a very nice looking monument on a pedestal because after a few months or a couple of years, the, the, the uh, system doesn't work anymore. And that's the problem with the Russian systems. It, they have a tendency to just want to sell it. They don't sell the uh, supporting infrastructure that goes with it. It makes our, makes our equipment more expensive because you're buying the logistical tail to go with it. Um, the Chinese, on the other hand, they offer um, our version, uh, or their version rather, of international military education and training. Uh, but you can imagine going to Beijing uh, or some other place in China to take a year or two of military education in, in, uh, in a, maybe Mandarin. It's a, it's a difficult proposition. It's easier to get people to come here. Um, economically, the Chinese have an advantage one could say, in that they have a large number of state-owned enterprises that take direction from either the party or the state. And sometimes, you know, with the Chinese, it's difficult to determine whether it's the party or the state uh, that actually are giving the orders. We don't have that, and we'll never have that. It's interesting, we hosted a Brazilian delegation 
a military delegation in Southern Command a couple of years ago, right after the Brazilians had returned to oil bid rounds. And they, they got exactly one bid in their bid round, and it was a consortium of a UK and a Chinese company, about 51 UK, 49% uh, Chinese. And so they asked us, why did you Americans not bid? Well, the question is, which Americans? Because we don't have a state-owned oil company. I mean, is it, is it Chevron? Is it, uh, is it uh, Exxon that you wanted to bid? Is it uh, uh, Anadarko, Apache? You name the dozens of companies that could have bid. So the question isn't, you know, why did you Americans not bid? The question really becomes, what were the, you know, the bidding parameters that would have attracted significant private investment from the rest of the world? Um, the UK company was there because they had been shut out of the previous bid rounds and they were, you know, relatively desperate to get into a very uh, hot prospect. The Chinese were there because the Chinese need natural resources, okay? So on the economic front, what we have to offer is um, a, if you will, a continued commitment. It's, it's kind of hard to do what we've done harder, okay? But a continued commitment to a rules-based order. Uh, that, that says you need to have open markets, you need to have um, uh, clear, enduring um, regulatory regimes that allow for the uh, innovation domestically and the um, importation of capital and know-how from abroad on a commercial basis. The Chinese will necessarily act in a mercantilist way. So it's really that shared system of values that we're talking about across the hemisphere that we have to reinforce, if you will. Uh, but that's doing the same thing harder, right? Okay. Um, information. We could probably do better on information. But again, the United States normally, we don't have a propaganda ministry. And uh, we don't want one. But we do have to do a better job, I think, of uh, extolling the benefits and the positive uh, responses. Uh, you know, I, I still go to a lot of Latin American conferences. and. If you're not careful, it lapses into the discussion that, that sounds like it did 35 years ago, if you're not careful, um, which is not true, all right? The hemisphere has fundamentally changed for the better in 35 years. But if you're not careful, it's almost like sackcloth and ashes uh, at these conferences where people uh, talk about how bad things are. And it's kind of like, I, you know, I had the same, uh, uh, many of the same people work for me for 15 years in Brazil. And they had moved up the economic ladder tremendously in that time as individuals, uh, these Brazilians. But if you listen to them as they were talking on their cell phones, as they were Facebooking, um, as they were shopping online for a new TV, they would talk about how bad things were. Fifteen years before, none of that existed. So we have a tendency, you know, to talk down things when we maybe ought to talk them up, and that's the eye of information. And that's why conferences like this are so important, okay, because most of you that have been involved in Latin America, you know the progress that has been made, notwithstanding the challenges that remain. I hope that answered your question. Okay, that gives you a footnote. You can take that back and put it in your war college thesis. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, General. My name is Marta Lucia Ramirez from Colombia, and I would like to know your perspective about uh, Maduro's militias. He was, he's arming this civilian population. He was preparing some military uh, activities uh, two weeks ago. Uh, so how is your perspective about, about these Bolivarian militias? Of, of course, it was uh, installed by Chavez many years ago. And if you believe that um, some former, uh, some foreign uh, people in Venezuela, maybe some Russians, some people from Cuba, could uh, have a kind of a threat for Colombia's security and maybe security in the region, because as you know, they invest a lot of money mm -hmm. in armament and new, mm -hmm. uh, yes, a lot of uh, armament. So you believe that it could create a kind of a threat security? Yeah. I think the thing that would, should concern us all about uh, the, the militias is, you know, it's not unusual in dictatorial regimes to have party troops, right, uh, that operate outside of the formal structure. So in, uh, just to use an example, in the old Noriega regime, they had the dignity battalions, if you got popular dignity battalions. So the, the reason those are dangerous is because they become tools of repression domestically, 
they're not particularly useful in a national defense role. They become more useful in a internal repression role. So to the extent that you see those things grow, um, particularly in a nation uh, that, like Venezuela right now, that has a fair amount of social um, uh, fracturing, uh, they be, they, we should be worried about them from the humanitarian side of the house and what they might do if things continue down the path they are uh, with uh, threats to the opposition, threats to anybody in the street who opposes the Maduro regime. That would be our concern. And then you'll have spillover effects on bordering countries, uh, mainly from the humanitarian uh, people fleeing the conflict, right? Uh, which would be something uh, that we see time and again around the world as states uh, fail, you know, in, in the progressive sense of the, the term, failing before they reach the failed state. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ola Gitkin. I'm with uh, Tellurian. Uh, and we're building LNG um, export facility in Louisiana. And uh, I wanted to ask you how you think about 